This conference will now be recorded. Thanks everyone for joining here today. This is a presentation to the Found Something group. Um, today we're going to be talking about the art of startup valuations and how much is, oh, hi. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about the art of startup valuations and how much is your billion dollar idea really worth. Um, I'm Jason Krauss, the CEO of Prepare for VC. We're a startup consulting firm that helps companies through the fundraising process, building out pitch decks, business plans, um, and your overall fundraising strategy, as well as other resources to help you along the way. Um, love being involved in this Found Something group. It's a great resource to connect with people from um, a variety of backgrounds to help with everything from funding, prototyping, legal aspects, um, business ethics, and more. And um, yeah, if you're not in, in this and you're seeing it on YouTube, just feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to introduce you to the group. Um, so the first, where I wanted to start with is just why does your startup have equity have value to begin with? So um, basically the, the equity stake or the stock in your company, you know, it has a, a few different reasons why it can have value. Um, one, one way seen here on the upper left, um, basically you're expecting that as you scale your company, the equity, um, a larger company will acquire you. Uh, it could be a corporation or, you know, a larger startup, um, even a private equity firm, just somebody is going to buy you because either the technology you built um, really benefits their business, uh, they're gaining their customers and revenue you built up over the years, uh, the access to the data and assets are extremely valuable for them. They're just really you have something they built that if they um if they started it themselves it would take a long time to get to where you are and you're adding a lot more value by just being an acquisition target to them so the equity in your company um at the point where you sell them everybody that came in now and participates in the growth is gonna um benefit from a sale down the road another option um you're building up equity to go public, that's an IPO, or just, um, yeah, basically going on the stock, going on any of the stock exchanges where um, investors can actively buy and sell shares. And um, the value in your equity is, you know, will become sort of a market value where people, um, you know, can actively participate in trading your company and benefit on the on the growth of of your startup um, and you know as when you have good months uh, they'll make gains and when you have bad months um, or yeah depreciation of your assets um, <laughs> there'll be some losses so yeah the other way is you know maybe maybe you're not Aiming to be um, either go public, be an acquisition target. Um, you're just looking to be a profitable company, sort of more of a long-term play, and you have the potential to also offer dividends and returns to your investors along the way. Um, and you know, maybe sometimes uh, it also might not have any equity value. Um, this could either be, you know, you are the company. It's uh, it's a consulting business or, um, you know, a solo solo venture um, that somebody acquires that you, um, you know, basically they're just hiring you. Um, so you're not, uh, or, you know, it could just be, um, maybe it's a great, uh, it's a short term play, like you're solving a problem that'll exist over a few years and, um, you know, it could be great financially along the way, but not um, not a lot of value in the equity of the company itself. 
Um, and that doesn't mean it's not a good business. It's just not as investable for, um, for the equity investors. Um, so when you look at valuations, there's a few different methods. One of them we look at is the, the cost to duplicate. So that would be, um, if I want to get, if I'm another company, I want to get to where you are today, what will it take monetarily to get there? So that includes finding and hiring an equally competent management team. Um, you need basically everyone with the same skill sets and backgrounds you have. Um, even if it's a small pool, you still have to convince them both to leave, leave their current position and take the same um, decreased salary you're taking over the next, um, you know, versus your market rate because you have equity in the company. So you're assuming, you know, this is uh, in this situation, you want to fully fund it um, or what would it cost if you were fully funding it and operating the same way um, without giving up any equity? So, um, yeah, acquiring you know, that's a cost of additional manpower, technology you've developed to bring it to the current stage rapidly. Um, and yeah, basically almost immediately or as immediately as possible. Um, same thing with building the equal brand, brand neck recognition you've built up and achieving the same level of ongoing sales rapidly. So, you know, as you're, as you're a small, um, you know, in a newer stage company, it might take, um, if a large corporation did this, maybe it takes them $2 million and a month to get to where you are today as you're, uh, if you're looking to replicate, you know, in Uber, it'll take um, billions of dollars to get to where they are. And um, yeah, and a lot of, uh, manpower marketing um, technology around that to get to there as rapidly as possible. Um, so that's, yeah, that's sort of one method. Um, and throughout these, they're sort of all areas you focus on in terms of valuing your company, but don't necessarily choose um, one versus another. You sort of take the mix of, of what's most important to your company and to the investors and come up with the best solution and valuation for your firm. Another one is just you back into the valuation. Um, so you project out a realistic exit potential in five to seven years. You can use this by um, you know, projecting out sales, the costs associated with those, um, look at some market trends and, uh, and the potential to just figure out you know, th this is uh, this is our year five, year seven um, revenues that are realistic, realistically possible for our company. Um, companies in our industry sell for four, six, whatever the multiple is uh, times that revenue or profit. Um, then you find out your exit potential. You also need to figure out the investment needed along the way from outside investors, whether it's um, angels, VCs, uh, family offices, to get to the place where you'll be able to exit. Um, and yeah, sort of back into the, the amount, um, basically the amount of growth in the company you'll be facing outside of, um, outside of that future investment. So if you think you're going to be, um, for instance, if you're going to be a $100 million company in five years, but you need $20 million to get there, you're basically, um, you know, an $80 million, you'll be an $80 million pre-money company uh, before that investment. Then you find that what risk multiples apply to your stage. So if you're looking at most, mostly like seed stage investors, um, you're looking for, they're probably looking for a 20 times return or more. Um, series A with tra a lot more traction and revenues could be looking more towards a 10X multiple. Um, 
you know, later as you're within uh, or smaller amounts as you, with your when you're within a year or two of exit um, and have a lot more growth to show from that. So basically, and you're finding the current equity valuation investors we need to hit the desired returns. So, you know, in that scenario, um, we're saying it's a $4 million company we've built up today. Um, we're going to need, uh, basically, we're going to exit for $100 million and take $20 million of equity down the road. Um, there's, our investors are still getting about a 20x return. Um, you know, it's great if you can show use some of these other scenarios and also show, yeah, they're getting, you know, much more than expected. And there's a little bit of wiggle room in terms of for, in terms of, um, you know, any unknown circumstances that come up that might affect, you know, how much you need to raise or the valuations you're giving up shares at along the way. Um, There's, sorry, one second. Um, yeah, so one other, um, or what I meant to talk about in the middle is uh, using industry comparables. Um, so this will be different than the, the one that's shown on here. Um, basically, comparables are just saying, my, my company is pretty similar to these three other firms that are out there. Um, and based on the valuations they were at either right now or right before, um, basically, yeah, either right now or when they were earlier, earlier um, on in their development stage, they were receiving a $5 million valuation or they're receiving a ten million dollar valuations, and we're going to be even better than they are. So, um, just using industry comparables is another way to um, sort of showcase your value and uh, where you fit in the in the investment marketplace. Um, the fourth method is just using revenue multiples or industry multiples. Um, usually, this is a little later stage for startups. Um, you know, once they're they're up and running, have consistent revenues. Uh, basically, you know, you're gonna have um, big growth, or ideally, you'll have um, you know growth patterns that are um, pretty large. So what you're gonna do is, uh, you you know, you're not gonna take the full um, like a full year snapshot of returns. You'll take how much you're making each month and sort of annualize um, your most recent sales out for the year to say, you know, maybe we made $100,000 last month. That means we're going to be making at least $12 million for the year. Um, so you multiply, or sorry, uh, $1.2 million for the year. Um, you're going to multiply that by the industry standard revenue multiples that companies get acquired at. and um, you know, if you're a little earlier on, you might adjust a little bit upwards for the growth trajectory. If you're um, around like, you know, a series series A to B level um, or later, you might keep it consistent with that revenue multiple and just basically in this method, investors are, you know, betting purely on on the growth of the company. So, you know, if they come in um, paying, valuing your company at four times your revenues and they think you can sell for four times your revenues, um, they're just, they basically make money dependent on the, the growth of the revenues in your company, which is, um, you know, a pretty fair position for both sides and puts them in line with um with the founders in terms of the goals of the company um so some major things to consider here are investor returns you want to make sure um basically 
anything you present, uh, you know, the investors are going to be happy um, with their position in the company. Um, so that's basically making sure, you know, they're, they, a lot of times, you know, they can add a lot of value besides, um, besides their investment, whether it's connections in the industry or um, just advice on uh, situations they faced with other other companies themselves or investments of their own. So, you know, making sure they have enough incentive to focus on your venture over their other um, other portfolio companies. And that's not as much of an issue because, I mean, that sort of determines whether or not they go into the deal in the first place. But it's just something to consider when you're um, scoping out the uh, yeah investment um, investors to join your deal. Um, the founder incentives are pretty critical here. Um, you know, as much as investors want to have a lot of equity in the companies they're investing in, they never want to have too much equity that the founder feels disincentivized to stay there, work, and put all their effort into the company. So, you know, if um, basically, yeah, even a, you know, a, a, most investors don't want to take um yeah basically a large enough large enough percentage in the company where they feel that down the road the founder is going to be you know owning 10 percent of the of the stock by the time um by the time it exits and uh you know isn't really going to be as passionate about about working there might be looking on to on to the next thing. Um, they really want to make sure it's structured in a way that um, everybody on both sides is going to benefit um, benefit along with the growth of the company and be working together towards that. Um, future dilution. Um, this is more crucial at an earlier on stage, uh, especially for companies that will need large infusions of capital usually um basically you know companies that need to produce a high growth trajectory in order to be first to market or capture capture a particular space um so in dilution basically if you're coming in as um you know as an early investor maybe you put in um Maybe you put in fifty, a hundred thousand dollars as an angel, um, and you got a pre pretty good, uh, or what you thought were good terms. But then a VC comes in, and you know they put a hundred thousand, or they put, you know, say it's a, a VC puts in a hundred million dollars of capital into the company. Um, your percentage ownership um yeah really dwindles down and um you know you're gonna need to have the valuation of the company scale with the investment amount to really um capitalize on exit potential there so there's a few ways to account for dilution including um uh basically you know some caps on uh or convertible nodes can be a method giving you the same terms as larger investors in the next round. Um, basically, some other uh, anti-dilution metrics um, that let you, um, you know, more for smaller VC rounds that follow, uh, that would let you um, re-up your same percentage in the company and sort of follow on with, uh, to keep your your investment percentage in the company, um, some other metrics, uh, or other ways of um, getting into into that as well. Um, we had a question about uh, what a safe is, so that's also um, basically another. Er, so, in terms of um, ways investors can invest in the company, um, they can go into 
they can go into equity, um, basically, the, or they can do a common stock, which is sort of the same pool of shares the founders are getting. Um, they'll be basically the last ones to be paid back at an exit, um, but they'll get the uh, basically all the remaining value of, of the equity um, in the company. It's usually you know, the same as like the founders pool, common stock of, uh, of shares. There's preferred, um, most common uh, term of, or most common equity for, um, for investments are called uh, convertible preferred equity. That's basically, there's um, a certain percentage um, return you're expected to get as an investor and then you can convert that. Um, you can convert that into common stock as uh, as the company, you know, prepares for an exit, and you're expecting a um, larger percentage of the co company. So uh, th the main thing about preferred stock is it's paid back earlier on. It gives investors some incentive to um, to join, or basically to uh, protection on the downside if the company fails and needs to have, uh, if it goes bankrupt, um, basically preferred shares get paid back right after all the debt that's owed on the company. Um, so yeah, it's just a protect, more of a protection most investors like to receive. Um, then there's convertible notes and safes. Um, convertible notes are technically debt at the point of time you invest in them. Um, it's basically saying we're loaning company to your money. Um, we're loaning money. We're loaning uh, capital to your company um, at a future. Usually, uh, standard terms are you know we'll be loaning this capital to your company, um, getting six to ten percent interest. Um, and at the point where you raise the next round or there's a qualified financing um, which can be you know a certain amount of capital that comes into the company um, we'll have the option to convert all of that initial debt plus any interest we earned into um, into equity or into the same terms as um, the investors in the next round get um, but because we came in earlier, we're going to get that the 20% discount or basically 20% more equity than that next round of investors gets. Um, there's also ways to cap it. So, you know, there's a minimum or, yeah, minimum amount of um, or a minimum percentage of equity or valuation cap that those investors that came in earlier on get. Um, and they're more incentivized to come in earlier versus waiting to um, do a next round when the capital isn't as urgent as it is right now. Um, a safe sort of taken um, some of the aspects of the convertible note, except for the main fact that it's not considered debt, it's just a simple agreement for future equity. So basically you're saying, um, you know, we're gonna get this, uh, we're gonna get the terms, we're gonna get, um, basically future equity at a discount to to what the next investors put in we might even get a valuation cap on our investment but it's not going to be considered debt we won't be paid back um you know as a debt holder if the company went bankrupt right now uh we're just going to be purely investing for that future equity we'll get in your company and um you know it saves uh it's the least costly um, form to set up legally. So, you know, one of the main benefits, it started out in Silicon Valley. It was a way to uh, to say, like, or basically to invest quickly. Um, no real, there's a minimal amount of legal work required to offer a safe. Um, you can get finance quickly, grow your company, and sort of come back and raise the next round. Um, and convert those uh, those safe holders into equity holders at their um, 
would that benefit you offered them originally? Um, one other aspect I wanted to mention is just closing doors. Um, so this means, you know, obviously there is a some negotiation, especially in finding your lead investor. Um, if if you walk in, um, you know, and do say your valuation is, you know, something enormously high that investors, you know, feel like they're not even close to where you are in the company. Um, you might close those doors, not even have them, you know, come in and follow up for a conversation where they would have otherwise. So, um, you know, you want to make sure you value the company well enough that it benefits. Um, you're happy with it, it benefits everyone involved, but you're not coming in and saying, you know, this is a thirty million dollar company. I'm about to start development on and um there's no real traction yet i just uh yeah it has to be someone in line with um basically all those areas i mentioned um the comparable companies the um valuation potential and um sort of the traction revenue of the business so far um just making sure everything lines up and um you know, there is some room to negotiate, but um, yeah, generally, you know, it's got to be pretty close to where you come in. Um, where it's going to be pretty close to where you come in as a startup founder, and um, might be some terms that are negotiated or a small uh, change in the valuation from there. Um, and with that, yeah, happy to open it up to any other questions. Um, or you know, wrap it up, and um, we can also, uh, yeah, take any any comments. I'm gonna post this video on our Trello channel for the Found Something group, as well as uh, YouTube for people to comment and ask additional questions there. Hey, Jason. Good morning. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How you doing? Good. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, very informative. Uh, caught wind of those uh, four different ways to determine the valuation and just trying to figure out, you know, which which one would best fit uh, my company. Um, I know every, you know, situation is unique and it's very complicated to figure out a proper valuation. Um, you know, is it based on um, traction that you have? Is it only based on MRR um, or on, you know, future uh, hopefully, you know, future growth and future revenue. Um, so I have some traction, but don't really yeah. have um, uh, monthly recurring revenue. Um, I think the company I'm starting is in um, a unique position where it's not like a traditional business. It's more of a like a, a, a photo sharing app. I think we had spoken a couple of months ago Yeah. Uh, on what, what my exact company is, but how would I determine an appropriate valuation in that situation? Right, so um, yeah, these are more guidelines. I mean, there is um, basically in your presentation, you know, um, basically like in uh, doing the projection model, for example, um, from your starting point, you're gonna or you're going to be including um, some of those partnerships, other traction methods. Um, you know, even if it's not revenue, you're going to be including that both in your deck and in any um, projections you develop by uh, determining the value of your company. So, um, I mean, maybe you you value them as sort of assets of of your company that you have. Um, now and you know will help you scale or maybe it just is another way to showcase like that these um that these projections are realistic because you already have a bunch of interest um lined up and you know maybe they haven't converted into sales yet but there's a good chance they will um based on the interest you've received already um okay it's sort of yeah yeah and um you know, they're more, uh, yeah, I wanted to present um, a few, like, guidelines that you can use, but obviously there's, um, 
you know, there, there'd probably be a uh, hundred different ways to sort of value each company. Um, just, you know, um, yeah, some are going to be, even some will be, um, you know, on the projection part, uh, companies get bought based on the amount of users they have um, so, uh, versus, uh, you know, the amount of revenue coming in um, or, you know, the value of the data they've collected over the years. So, um, you know, that's important to consider what your most important um, metrics are and project those out as well to showcase to investors. Okay, thanks. Um, so what, what's the difference between like, a, let's say method one and method three? Like uh, the cost to duplicate versus like comparables? Yeah, so the comparables is basically, um, I want to say, uh, you know, I'm looking at if I'm um, if I'm starting a or if I started a ride sharing company, for example, and um, you know, I'm I have a platform launched in two cities, and I want to you know raise some funding to scale it from there. I'm gonna look at um, what the valuation was of Uber, Lyft, Fast, and some of the other competitors at the same point when they were um when they were in two cities as well and looking to scale um versus the first method of how much it is to duplicate would be you know if i'm another person that wants to go out start this from scratch um what would it cost to hire a whole team of developers um hire myself as the ceo and the rest of my team around me um to basically go out, create this as quickly as possible and get to the same place, um, the same amount of, you know, do enough marketing to get it to the same place that this company is that's coming into pitch. Okay. And you said hire yourself. So as you're going into a funding round, um, it is perfectly acceptable to include, um, you know, a salary for yourself or do investors prefer to see you hold that off until you're making serious revenue. Yeah, it's acceptable. Um, as long as you're, you know, f um, yeah, basically if you're, you know, coming in full time on the company, um, even if you weren't before, yeah, it's acceptable to include a, a salary for yourself. Um, generally, you know, generally, yeah, and I mean, they want you committed, uh, yeah, committed to the opportunity and, you know, being able to dedicate the full time to it. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely acceptable. Uh, and, you know, it might be less than what you'd be making if you were, um, you know, working at, um, at a position elsewhere. But, um, yeah, you're sort of incentivized by also having that equity stake in the company. Okay, thank you. And uh, going back to like uh, the founder incentives, um, you know, you don't want to give away too much, you know, where the founder isn't into the project anymore. He had to give away so much to, to get uh, funding. Um, what would be an appropriate amount to give away? And, you know, how much should a founder hold on to? Yeah. Um, so again, this is uh, it's more dependent on. Um, I mean, you have to look at the the big picture of um, what you're aiming to grow this to. So, if you're, um, you know, if this is a company, maybe you can raise a million, two million dollars, um, scale it up to, uh, you know. 20, 40, 50 million dollar exit, um, you know, you'll be, you'll want to have a good percentage in that and you'll be happy with the exit potential there. Um, if this is a company, you're going to need, you know, a lot more capital, but it could be, it could be that billion dollar idea, billion dollar company. Um, maybe you own a, a small percentage by the end of it, but, um, you know, you're sort of betting on this becoming um you know a worldwide or nationwide um 
company. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the most important thing I'd say is like at the early stage, you know, you want to maintain um, enough equity that you have flexibility in the direction where you can take the company and um, yeah, still be still be safe to go in either direction as a, as the company changes. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Jason. I don't think I have any more questions uh, at the moment, but I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining and um, yeah, excited to follow up with you and yeah, we can, we can catch up, uh, catch up for a call sometime soon as well. That's awesome. I appreciate it. I will, uh, I'll shoot you an email. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, yeah, you can check out my website at prepareforvc.com or um, feel free to message me to, um, to connect further. Thanks.